Hey guys, Tom itself here. In this video, I want to talk about Titanfall's burn cards and how they relate to things in Call of Duty, Battlefield, and other games. Burn cards are earned one life boosts or weapons that your character collects in one match and then uses in another. The one I started off this gameplay with gives me additional time off my Titan or Titan Core ability when I kill enemy minions. And when I die here, I'll switch over to an Amped Smart Pistol, which is a burn card weapon. Amped weapons tend to be pretty good. The Amped Smart Pistol has a faster lock-on time than a Smart Pistol with the Enhanced Targeting mod, though not quite the extra range. It also has more damage, so it's capable of a two-hit kill up close, instead of the typical three. But you won't be spawning with a burn card every life. You can only use three in one game, and which ones you get are random. And the really powerful, awesome ones are also really rare. Things like always having that invisibility cloak on, in addition to your normal pilot ability. They help break up the flow of the game, add some more variety, and give players some more stuff to play with. While these aren't something you'd want for a super serious competitive game, for a casual fun game like Titanfall, they can serve a really, really useful purpose. Making you rage, because 20-30 seconds into the game, you got Titan punched in the back when you had no idea that guy had a Titan right behind you. No, actually, in a strange way, they help to balance the game. While the effects of the individual burn cards are borderline imbalanced to completely imbalanced, the actual effect is that they give the developers more information with which to balance the game. As we've moved to multiplayer games where the developers can quickly push small updates out, it's led to a data-driven game design, and changing a weapon stats is just a playlist update away. And at the same time, players have come to expect those frequent balance changes, so that they don't have to spend weeks or months when it's clear that some weapons are underpowered or overpowered before the developer works out a way to fix things. Now, needing to update game balance is nothing new. The original playtesters aren't going to get everything perfectly right in the complex games, especially when you've got weapons, dozens of weapons with lots of mods. It's impossible to balance it all, and so you have to expect to do some balancing after release. But, at the same time, those are the same playtesters who are going to be trying to rebalance the same weapons. But actually, we should take a step back. What was overpowered? What was underpowered? Why were they that way? What in the original balance testing failed or came up short? Players are always going to complain about game balance. That's just human nature. And they're often going to be on different sides of whether something is underpowered or overpowered. And so what developers have come to rely on is their ability to collect statistics about everything going on in every single game with all of the players. It's pretty much exactly the idea of big data. No longer do you have to rely on certain subsets of the data. You have all of the data. Every time that weapon or ability has ever been used, the developer has that information. That's just the first step of the basic decision-making loop. They see there's a problem, the developer decides what they're going to do to try to address it, and then the same statistics system from in-game lets them know, did it work? Do we need to do more? Did we go overboard? DICE, the Battlefield developers, have recently given us a very good example of this system and some of the issues with it, mostly in the Javelin, the lock-on anti-vehicle launcher. At release, it would normally do 25 damage to a tank, or 4 hits to kill. Not a whole lot, no one really used it, it wasn't very good, so DICE decided to improve it a little bit, and increase the damage to 34, or 3 hits to kill, and it was too good. So then, something like a week later, they dropped the damage back down to 30. And they also changed something that's kind of hard to quantify, the ability to have multiple rockets in the air at the same time. Now, some other launchers had that ability at one point, but they'd patched that, saying it was a bug. But they didn't fix it with the Javelin on that first damage upgrade from 25 to 34, and waited until they dropped the damage from 34 to 30 before fixing it. Now, on one hand, it's nice to see that decision loop going from, we see there's a problem, we think this is how to address it, uh, we see there's still a problem here, cycling through very fast. On the other hand, it's probably going to drive a lot of players crazy, and when you deal with things like metagame, things that are just popular within the community, balancing that stuff gets really tricky, and it also leads to questions of what is the developer's original playtesting group doing that they think these updates are okay when they change their mind a week later. It's pretty obvious that there's an issue with step number two of that decision loop, deciding what to do. They have enough information to say there's a problem and they want to try to address it, but they're not sure how. 
One of the ways DICE has tried to address this lack of information is with battle pickups, the weapons that spawn in on the maps, usually in positions that are pretty good for those weapons. Here you see the USAS-12 shotgun with frag rounds. It is a nasty, nasty thing. I never used the one in Battlefield 3, but uh, if it was anything like this, oh my god. This is not something you want to let players spawn in with, but it's a whole lot of fun to use for a couple of magazines every now and again. Or there are a whole lot of these anti-material rifles, which normally just get used because they're a one-hit kill to anywhere on the body at all ranges. They balance them out a little bit by making them slightly inaccurate, but for most ranges they're, they're nasty too. You could not let someone spawn in with this either, but over hundreds, thousands of games, it gives DICE the information to answer the question, what would happen if we gave players a weapon that would be a one-hit kill to anywhere on the body? We don't ever expect to see that, but it gives them another data point to work with when they're trying to balance weapons. And you can be sure that that semi-automatic grenade launcher battle pickup told DICE how they should go about balancing the semi-automatic grenade launcher that can be equipped with the assault kit that they included in the Naval Strike DLC. Then sometimes it's not included with the game design and it just happens accidentally. I guess this is just starting at step 3 in that decision making loop. But in this case, the Maniac Juggernaut came with an assault rifle instead of a combat knife. Speculation is that the assault rifle was the default weapon when one was not equipped, and someone forgot to equip the weapon for the Maniac instead of the combat knife. But the result was not super overpowered. It wasn't game breaking at all. Sure, it's good, better than it should be, but the degree to which it's better than it should be is less than the degree to which the normal assault juggernaut with the minigun is worse than it should be. And if having the stats of how well the maniac with an assault rifle performed tells Infinity Ward how they should go about balancing the regular assault juggernaut, I think we'd count that as a win. Another source of information for lots of games are hardcore game modes where player health is usually reduced. And of course that messes with all kinds of balance, but I'd say with lots of semi-automatic weapons when you're looking at one, two, or three shots to kill, maybe four in Battlefield's case, it's really good information to have. I'd say explosives too, really good information there, except with friendly fire on, explosives kind of get used in different ways in hardcore modes. But then for a while they had a playlist in Ghosts that was higher player health called Heavy Duty. I bet they got a lot of really good information on that without actually having to go in and change all the weapon values. They just changed the player health in the one game mode. Players seemed to like the novelty of it for a while and they probably got a lot of really good information out of that. Another example is Guild Wars. The original Guild Wars PvP had these weird monthly effects that they introduced towards the end of the game's life cycle. Here it was a way to shake up the metagame a little bit, do some interesting things with a game that players had really gotten good with and well, had been balanced pretty well at that point. Now these rules would be applied to all players and so things could be more competitive unlike the kind of casual nature that burn cards have. You'd need a lot of knowledge of the game to have a good idea for how things would play out, but there were things like the inverse ninja law. For each allied player in earshot, you deal 5% less damage. For each opposing player in earshot, you deal 5% more. Or keep yourself alive. If you heal yourself, healing is increased by 50%. If you heal an ally, healing is reduced by 20%. Massive damage, you have 20 less armor, but 200 more health. Healing you receive is increased by 25%. That's effectively 41% more damage most of the time, 33% more hit points, and armor buffs get a lot more useful. It also nerfs armor ignoring skills. All sorts of weird changes. And all of these things from all these games, from burn cards to battle pickups to strange oops bugs to different game modes with different healths to, well, even strange monthly effects, they all have the same general function in giving the developers more information to work with. It's certainly not the only reason they're there, but the fact that the developer will get more information from that stuff, be able to balance their game better, know how to make a better game in the future, is one reason it's worth it to them to go ahead and add this kind of stuff. Sometimes data-driven game design gets a pretty bad rap. Understandably, they're a lot of times just trying to figure out how to milk players for more money. But balancing all the aspects of a modern AAA shooter is quite the challenge, and everybody benefits if they get it right. Well, that's about all I had. Nothing really tactically useful, but I thought it was a very interesting thread I saw connecting a lot of different games. Thanks for listening, I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.